everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you have never seen my face on your screen before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of david octoloni he was was a young man from Australia who was horrifically murdered in 2010 and sickeningly the people responsible were people that he cared about and trusted and actually some might say that committing murder was in this killer's DNA because it turns out that one of the perpetrators older family members was a notorious serial killer a serial killer that I'm sure many of you would have actually heard of in fact the monster who murdered David did so because he wanted to follow in his killer relative's footsteps. But just quickly before we get into the case, I would like to say a special thank you to HelloFresh for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. HelloFresh are of course regular supporters of this channel. I've spoken about them many times and it's not without good reason. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service and they offer more than 30 different delicious recipes every single week as well as 70 plus convenience items all delivered straight to your door. One of the best things about HelloFresh in my opinion is the fact that you can make it work around your schedule. Their plans are completely flexible so say for example you usually have four HelloFresh recipes delivered every week but for some reason one week you don't need all four. Maybe you're eating out a bit more that week or something. Well with HelloFresh you can change how many recipes you want each week so that no food goes to waste. You can also change your meal preferences, you can change what day your HelloFresh box gets delivered and you can change your address. It's super easy to do both on their website and also on the HelloFresh app. HelloFresh offers meal kits for vegetarians, they have meal kits for pescatarians as well as fit and wholesome meal kits too which make it easier than ever for you to stick to your goals and eat well without having to sacrifice flavour. And HelloFresh are a sustainable brand. They're actually the first carbon neutral meal kit company and nearly all of their packaging is recyclable. I really could not recommend HelloFresh enough. Myself and my family have been using them for probably nearly two years now and we just love them. They save so much time and so much money and stress and the food is incredible. So if you would like to give HelloFresh a try then I have a very good deal for you. If you go to hellofresh.com and use the code 65MOLLY you will be able to get 65% off plus free shipping. The link to the HelloFresh website will be at the the top line of the description box. Once again, thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video and being long-time supporters of this channel. Thank you to all of you watching for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back more than 12 years now to late 2010 in Belangolo, which is an area located around the Belangolo State Forest in New South Wales in Australia. And this is David Octoloni. He was 17 years old at the time that this case occurred and he was from New South Wales. He actually lived in a town called Bargo which is not far from Belangolo, it's less than a 40 minute drive away. David J Octoloni was born on the 20th of November 1993. His mother was called Donna Locke and his father was also called David and according to sources David was actually one of six children. He had five siblings, five little brothers, I believe he was the oldest and he was described by his father as just being an incredible big brother. He was so, so kind and so gentle with his younger siblings and he was always there to look after them. David's parents separated when he was still quite a young boy and I believe it was during the whole separation process when he actually started staying with his grandparents. Their names were Sandra and David Octoloni. So there were three generations of Davids in this family. There may have even been more. I don't know if it was like a tradition for the firstborn son to be called David or something. But anyway, whilst his parents were splitting up, David was looked after by his grandparents. And this was only actually supposed to be a temporary thing, but it turns out that it became permanent. He continued living with his grandparents in Bargo and he lived with them up until this case occurred. But he was still very close with his 
his parents, Donna and David, and he would speak to them and see them as often as he could. David was described by his loved ones as just being a very happy and loving and caring young man. He was so fun to be around. He was also very trusting. I think he always had a lot of faith in other people, always gave them the benefit of the doubt. And his mother Donna said that he was someone that just loved life. He enjoyed life. David loved things like scooters and going out on his skateboard. He loved bikes and motorbikes. He also loved playing games on his PlayStation. He was just a typical teenage boy in that sense. And he was very friendly and popular. He had a lot of friends and he spent most of his free time with his friends. He had a big group of friends that he would hang around with in Bargo. This group of other young boys slash young men who I think were all aged around the same age as David, around like 16, 17, 18 years old. And a couple of the boys in this group who would go on to be important parts of this case were Chase Day, Cohen Klein and Matthew Mulman, who were all aged around 18. So they were just a little bit older than David. And David had been friends with these boys for a long time, a good few years at least, I believe. And whilst David seemed to really like his friend Matthew Mulman, his family, David's family, had very different feelings about him, about this friendship. David's family did not like Matthew Mulman in particular because he was a very, very arrogant and cocky and, to be honest, aggressive young man. In fact, one of the first times David's grandmother, Sandra, met Matthew, David introduced them to each other and Matthew literally marched up to Sandra. He got right in her face and he said, do you know who I am? And Sandra said, yeah, you're Matthew Mulman. Mormon. However, he responded saying, no, I'm Matthew Malat. Now, many of you may actually recognise that last name, Malat, because it turns out that Matthew is actually the nephew of notorious Australian serial killer, Ivan Malat. I've not actually done a video on Ivan Malat, so if you would like to see that, please do let me know in the comments. But he was responsible for the backpack murders, which occurred around the late 80s to early 90s. Ivan Malat is known to have killed at least seven people, two men and five women, but it's believed that he probably had way, way more victims than that. He would approach hitchhikers as they were walking along the Hume Highway in Australia, and he would for them a lift to their destination. But of course, that was never his intention. Instead, he would abduct them, take them to Belangelo State Forest, and there he would murder them and bury their bodies. The Belangelo State Forest was like Ivan Malat's playground almost, and it became infamous as a result of this case. Ivan Malat was convicted of his crimes in 1996, and he was given seven life sentences. He would be spending the rest of his his life behind bars. And at the time that he was convicted, Matthew Malat would have been just a toddler. He was born in December of 1992, so he would have been around three, four years old. Now, Matthew's parents were called Scott Muleman and Deb Malat, and Deb's father was Ivan Malat's brother. So Ivan was effectively Matthew's great uncle, and Matthew wouldn't have really known Ivan at all. I think Ivan was arrested for the murders in 1994, when Matthew would have been around just two years old. So I don't believe they even ever met. But despite that, it seems as though Matthew, as he grew older, he developed an obsession with his serial killer uncle. As you can imagine, the majority of the Malat family hated the fact that they were related to a murderer, so much so that they changed their last name because they didn't want people to know about their connection to Ivan. But Matthew felt very differently. He wasn't even born with the Malat surname. When he was born in 1992, he was given his father's last name, Muleman. He was called Matthew Muleman. Although, just as a side note, his father, Scott Muleman, wasn't actually Matthew's biological father. He was his stepfather. His biological father, who I believe was called Peter, he wasn't really in the picture. So yeah, Matthew was raised by Scott, hence why he was given Scott's last name. However, later in his life, I believe when he was around 14 years old, Matthew decided to change it. He wanted to be called Matthew Malat because he wanted people to know 
know that he was related to a serial killer. To him, that was something to be proud of. Growing up in his childhood, Matthew was described as just being a very normal kid. He didn't really get into much trouble in school. He had a few friends. He wasn't the most popular, but I think he had friends. He was kind of just one of those kids in school that was in the background a lot, never really drew much attention to himself. From what I can gather, his home life was okay. Apparently he didn't really get along with his stepdad Scott very often. They would argue quite a lot. But I think apart from that, pretty average home life. However, as he entered his teenage years, friends of his noticed that he really started to change. As I said, when he was 14, he started going by Matthew Malat because he was inspired by his killer uncle Ivan. And he just became so, so dark and so aggressive. He became arrogant and violent violent. He would brag to people that he was related to Ivan Milat. He just had such a fascination with Ivan. It was like Ivan was his idol, which is just so sick and twisted that this teenage boy was looking up to an evil serial killer. Ivan was his inspiration. Matthew always used to say to his friends actually that he wanted to go to Belangolo Forest because he wanted to visit the place where his uncle committed his murders and buried his victim's bodies. Matthew also started carrying weapons with him wherever he went. He always carried a knife with him and his friends said that he would just play with it all the time. He would always have it out in his hand. His friend said that it was this knife that you could flick up and sometimes Matthew would just sit there in silence and he would just constantly keep flicking up his knife. He was just a very very dodgy character. Not the kind of teenager that you'd want hanging around with your child and that's exactly how David Octoloni's family felt. His grandmother Sandra said to David that he needed to be wary around Matthew because it was clear that he was was not a good guy. She even said to David, you do know that he's related to the backpacker killer, Ivan Milat, but David apparently just kind of brushed it off and he said to his grandma that she needed to try harder to see the good in people because like I mentioned earlier on in the video, David was such a trusting young man. He was always one to give people the benefit of the doubt. So he wasn't gonna just stop being Matthew's friend just because of his association with Ivan Malat. It's been speculated that David actually felt sorry for Matthew, that he had that family connection to a serial killer, so he wanted to be there for him. That's just the kind of person that David was. However, it wasn't long before Matthew began to take his aggression out on his friend David. He started to get really violent with him. There was one occasion, I believe this happened in the months leading up to this case actually taking place, when one day Matthew and David were I think just hanging out outside of David's home in Bargo where he lived with his grandparents when all of a sudden Matthew started attacking him. He just started pushing and shoving David around and David's grandmother Sandra witnessed this and she ran out of the house and ordered Matthew Malat to leave immediately and not come back. But Matthew marched over to Sandra. He got right in her face once again like he did that other time and he said to her, quote, no one tells me what to do. And even Sandra said that in that moment, she was scared of him. She was scared of this teenage boy, as I think anyone would be. Matthew Malat was terrifying. And this clearly angered Matthew because in a way he kind of started harassing David's family a little bit after this. Sandra said that he would often just drive by her house for no reason whatsoever. He would drive by and slam on the brakes to try and make loads of noise. It was like he was trying to intimidate them. I also read on another source that there was another occasion when Matthew actually threatened David with his knife. He threatened to cut him. But David apparently managed to calm Matthew down. He managed to de-escalate the situation and he wasn't hurt. And I wonder if David maybe thought that Matthew would never actually do anything violent to him because even after all of this happened, he would still hang out with him. So maybe he just thought that Matthew was 
was full of empty threats. Yeah, he would go around bragging about being related to Ivan Milat and he would carry around a knife, but maybe that was just because he wanted to look tough, even though he actually wasn't. Or maybe David felt that he couldn't really stop being friends with him because obviously they were both a part of the same friend group. If David isolated himself from Matthew, then that would probably mean that he would have to stop seeing his other friends too. And he obviously wouldn't have wanted that. And and so David continued being mates with Matthew Malat, completely unaware just how this friendship would eventually end, completely unaware of the evil and the danger that was ahead. The date was the 20th of November 2010 and that day it was David's birthday. He turned 17 years old so he was spending the occasion celebrating with his family. He was with his mother Donna that morning. They had a bit of a catch-up. She gave him some money as a birthday gift and then following this he went home to see and spend time with his grandparents and the rest of his family. And by all accounts, David had a really nice afternoon. He opened presents, his grandparents got him a cake and they sang happy birthday. He had some beers with his granddad. So far, it had been the perfect day, the perfect way to celebrate turning 17. Later that evening, David decided to go and spend the rest of his birthday with a few of his friends, the three friends that I mentioned earlier, Chase Day, Cohen Klein, and of course, Matthew Milan. So he met up with them. He and Chase Day were picked up by Cohen and Matthew in one of their cars. The group then picked up some weed. They planned to smoke some cannabis that night and then Matthew Malat decided that the four of them were going to go to the Belangelo State Forest. That's where he wanted to take them, the place he'd always wanted to go because of his great uncle. And so that's exactly what they did. Matthew, Chase, Cohen and David all went to Belangelo. However, it was following this when David seemed to just disappear. David Ottoloni never returned home that night after going out with his friends. I don't think his family initially panicked too much when David didn't come home that first night. You know, he was a teenage boy. He was really nearly an adult. He was just a year away from being 18. And he often would be out for long periods of time with his friends. So this wasn't too unusual. However, it was when he didn't come home home again the night after too when his grandparents and his parents really started to worry. Not just because he hadn't come back but also because he hadn't even gotten in contact with them. He hadn't phoned them or sent them a message saying where he was and when he would be home which was not like David. They were trying to ring him, ring his phone constantly but they never got an answer. David just wasn't picking up and as time went by of course the family were just getting more more and more concerned. They couldn't understand what had happened and why David had just gone radio silent all of a sudden. But it wouldn't be too long before they had answers, before they found out why they hadn't heard from David. Because you see, just the day after he was last seen, the day after his 17th birthday on the 21st of November 2010, a young man walked into the local police station. There he sat down with the detectives and he told them that he just witnessed his friend David Octoloni being murdered. This young man was Chase Day, one of the three friends that David had gone out with the previous night. After the murder, Chase went home and he said that he just felt completely sick to his stomach after what had just happened and it wasn't long before he cracked he broke down and he told his dad about it and afterwards his dad said to him okay we need to go to the police you have to tell the police about all of this and so that's exactly what he did i believe it was about 19 hours after the murder occurred when chase day went to the station he went there late in the evening of the 21st of november and the detectives sat down and they took his statement slash interviewed him well into the early hours of the next morning. Chase Day described how on the evening of the 20th of November, the evening of David's 17th birthday, the group of friends, he, David, Cohen and Matthew, 
Matthew all went to the Belangolo State Forest. They parked their car up, they were chatting. David began rolling a joint because remember on the way they picked up some weed to smoke. So he started rolling the joint and at some point Matthew Malat got out of the car leaving the rest of the group still in there. He got out of the car and he walked around to the boot or the trunk of the car and he waited there and eventually David got out of the car too and he went around to the boot also. I believe Matthew either called him round to the boot or Cohen Klein told him to go there and when he did, when David went to the boot, he was confronted by Matthew Malat holding an axe, a double-sided axe, which he had brought with him to the forest and had just gotten out of the boot of the vehicle. And the next thing Chase Day heard whilst he was still in the car was a scream, a scream coming from David. Before David even had a chance to react or do anything, Matthew had raised the axe and he hit David. He hit him in the ribs or the upper torso area with it. Some sources state that after this first blow, David did try to run from Matthew, but of course he would have been so severely injured, he would have been in so much pain and he wouldn't have gotten far at all. Chase Day said that David was just kind of going around the car in circles because that was all he could do whilst Malat followed him with the axe and eventually Malat managed to get David on the ground and he ordered him to lie face down in the dirt. Chase told the police that he didn't really see much of the actual attack because it was the middle of the night, it was pitch black outside, apparently the car headlights were on but still he couldn't, he couldn't really see much. But of course he could hear, he could hear what was going on, he could hear David's screams. And Chase said that he did get out of the car and he tried to tell Matthew to please stop and leave David alone. But Matthew wouldn't and Cohen Klein told Chase to just get back in the car. And so Chase did because he was terrified that if he didn't, Matthew would turn the axe on him. Tom come over to me and he said just get in the car. And I heard Octo start screaming because Matt hit him in the ribs with an axe. And I said, what are you doing this for? And he said, you stay the fuck out of it and get back in the car. And I did, I did what he said because I didn't, I didn't want to get hit. And he said, lay down. And Matt was like, Octo was like, don't do this, man. Like, crying, saying he was sorry. For more than 10 minutes after the first blow, David was begging Matthew for his life, begging him to stop, but Matthew wouldn't. Chase Day said that at some point David's hands must have been covering his face or something because he heard Matthew shout at David saying, move your hands, move your hands. All the while David is still screaming and shouting and crying until eventually Chase said that the screaming stopped. David went silent. And this was because after being hit with the axe by Malat again, he had died. Matthew Malat had just murdered his own friend. He murdered David Octoloni on David's 17th birthday in the Belangolo State Forest, the same place where his great uncle committed his murders all those years prior. After David was dead, Chase Day said that Matthew started saying to him and Cohen Klein that they needed to get rid of David's body. They needed to hide him somewhere so that he wouldn't be found and they wouldn't be caught for this. And so they dragged David's body along the ground and into a bush and they covered him with branches and leaves. He dragged up the along. He dragged. He dragged it along the ground. Did Matthew say to you why he wanted David dragged into the bush mm, so he wouldn't get found? Then they got back in the car and they left. They just left David's body there in the forest. According to one documentary, after this, the now group of three smoked cannabis, and Chase said that during during the drive home, Matthew seemed to be just so happy with himself. Chase said that he had like a rush of adrenaline. He was so proud of what he had just done. And Chase also said that he heard Cohen Klein say to Matthew something along the lines of, see, I told you you were going to go down the same path as your uncle. Oh, he was saying... What did they actually say? If Matt was saying, oh yeah, that was such an adrenaline rush. That was all I heard him say. And then Matt's like, oh, Colin was like, 
I, I told you that you were going to go down the same path as your uncle, and that was it. And then I started, I started losing. So Cohen Klein didn't seem phased by this at all either. As I mentioned, Chase said that he just felt so, so sick to his stomach at what he just witnessed. But Cohen Klein was fine. Like I said, it did not phase him. Almost like he was maybe in on it. He knew that it was going to happen. The next day, as we know, Chase Day just confessed everything to his dad. He could not keep this a secret and so he cracked and he told his father everything and then he went to the police and he told them his account, the account that I've just run through. And just a couple of hours after he went to the station, police officers went to the area in Belangelo State Forest where Chase said the attack took place and there they found David's body. It was exactly where it had been hidden by Mlat in a bush underneath some leaves. And it was following the discovery of his body when officers were sent to visit David's family and they informed them that a body had been discovered and that they had reason to believe that it was David. But the police needed confirmation so the family had to go and identify the body and I think they could only see his face the rest of him was covered up but of course when they did see his face they could confirm that it was David. Apparently David's eyes were open when they went to see him and his grandmother Sandra said that his eyes just looked so scared like he was just saying help me help me. So now the New South Wales were dealing with a murder inquiry and of course they already had their top suspects. Chase Day had told them who was responsible. Matthew Malat and also Cohen Klein who seemed to be an accomplice and so shortly after Chase Day gave his statement on the morning of the 22nd of November 2010 the police went to both of their houses to arrest them. When they got to Matthew's house he was actually in bed fast asleep so they woke him they told him why they were there that they were investigating the murder of David Octoloni and that they were going to arrest him and the detectives noted how calm Matthew was he literally didn't have any reaction at all he didn't deny it as far as I'm aware nor did he admit to it I think he just didn't really say anything again it was like he was so unfazed by it he just did not care now Matthew, do you agree with me that uh, I entered your bedroom and I said that you're under arrest? Yes. After his arrest, the police collected a couple of items from his house as potential evidence. They collected a hat and also a pair of shoes, both of which they believed he had been wearing on the night of the murder. And this was confirmed later on in the investigation because the shoes that they took from Matthew actually had traces of blood on them. And this blood was a match to David Octoloni. And I believe blood spots were also found on the hat as well. Following his arrest, Matthew was taken to the police station where he was questioned and his grandfather was actually with him in the interview he was allowed to be in there and once again in his interview he seemed completely unfazed he was calm there is footage of his interview online and I personally think it is so so creepy because it looks as though he is just staring at the camera the whole time he's not looking at his granddad or the detectives asking him the questions he's just staring into the camera with a blank expression on his face that's what it looks like to me anyway but yeah he was calm he didn't really react very much and he pretty much refused to answer any questions so it was clear to the detectives that Matthew Malat was not going to be cooperative for the purpose of this record what is your full name Matthew Stephen Malat I'm investigating the murder of David Octolaney who was killed on Saturday the 20th of November 2010 at the Blangla State Forest. Do you understand that? Yes. Now, I want to ask you some questions about that. Are you prepared to answer those questions? Meanwhile, as all of this was happening with Matthew, other officers had obviously gone to apprehend their second suspect, Cohen Klein. They arrested him and just like with Matthew, they also collected some potential evidence from his home. I believe they took some clothing, some shoes and also Cohen's mobile phone, which they intended to search and have a look through. Now, Cohen Klein, when he was taken to the police station to be interviewed, he was 
a lot more talkative than his friend Matthew Malat. Well, I say friend, but he fully implicated Matthew during his questioning. He admitted that, yes, he was there that night. He was there when Matthew beat David to death with the axe. However, I believe he claimed that he didn't know that that was going to happen beforehand. And he said that he, just like Chase Day, was absolutely terrified of Matthew. He basically said that he himself was a victim because he was so scared. So the police asked Cohen if at any point during the attack he tried to intervene and tell Matthew to stop, but, but he said no, he didn't. Again, he said that he was just too scared to do that. He was scared that if he tried to stop Matthew, Matthew would just kill him as well. And so he stayed quiet. Cohen did say that Chase Day tried to intervene. He tried to tell Matthew to stop, but Matthew just told him to shut up. And so both Chase and Cohen stayed in the car. At any stage, did you attempt to stop what Matt was doing to David? I couldn't, but if Chase was asking him to stop, and he just kept saying, shut the fuck up, Chase. So sort of thing. When, when did that conversation take place? When Octo was going around the car. Okay. I, I, I was literally, like, scared for my life. I couldn't say this in the mat. Like, or... I just get the shakes thinking of him. So, you know, I can't even sleep or nothing. However, the detectives didn't really believe Cohen Klein. They didn't believe that he was just an innocent bystander in all of this. I mean, firstly, if he really was so terrified of Matthew and he really had nothing to do with what happened to David, why didn't he go to the police after the murder like Chase did? And also they didn't believe him because of Chase Day's account. If you remember, Chase told them that after the murder, he heard Cohen say to Matthew how he knew that Matthew would go down the same path as his serial killer uncle, Ivan Malat. It was almost like Cohen was making a joke about the situation. Chase also said that when he got out of the car and began asking Matthew to leave David alone, Cohen told him to just stop and just get back in the car, leave Matthew to it. And apparently Chase as well told the detectives in his interview that during the attack, Cohen said to Chase something along the lines of, oh, don't worry, I've told Matthew not to attack you or hurt you because you're my mate. So that indicates that Cohen knew about the attack before it even started. He knew what Matthew's intentions were that night and he asked him not to hurt Chase. I guess he liked Chase more than he liked David. Chase has told us that as um, you got in the car, um, you you basically ushered me into the car as, you, as you're telling me. Um, and it's about that time that you've said uh, to him, um, I've asked Matt not to hurt you. I told him that you're my mate, or I'm your mate. Mm -hmm. Words to that effect, do you recall? That was a good said that. When, when did he say that? Is there any reason why you didn't ask him to um, not hurt David? Well, I couldn't really ask him because it was a bit late. So the police asked Cohen Klein about all of this and Cohen just kind of just kind of denied it but he was also changing his story a lot i think he was being really really inconsistent which just made the police believe even more that he was guilty so the police were pretty confident that cohen klein knew more and he had more involvement in this case than he was letting on they were obviously very confident that matthew malat was the one who physically carried out the murder but to be honest they weren't totally sure exactly what to believe when it came to chase day initially they did think that maybe his account wasn't wasn't quite 100% truthful. Maybe he, like Cohen Klein, was also more involved than he was letting on. And I think the main reason for this was because Chase actually told the detectives that even before they went to Belangolo Forest that evening, he did have his suspicions that something 
was going to happen later that night. He was worried that Matthew was going to do something to one of them, to David. And so the detectives asked him why he felt this way. And he said, just because he knew that Matthew wanted to go to Belangolo Forest later that evening, and he knew how desperate Matthew was to go there. He knew what Matthew was like, that he could be very violent and aggressive. And he knew just how obsessed he was with his murderous uncle, Ivan, how much he idolized him. It's also stated that in the lead up to the murder, Matthew had been saying to some of his friends that he was going to go to Belangelo and that, quote, someone was gonna die there. So clearly he had been planning this for a while. So that's why Chase had his concerns beforehand. He just had this feeling at the back of his mind that something was going to happen that night. So this confused the detectives, I think, and they had their reservations about Chase Day's story. And so he, alongside both Cohen Klein and Matthew Malat, was eventually charged in relation to this crime. Both Matthew Malat and Cohen Klein were charged with David's murder, whereas Chase Day was charged with accessory to murder after the fact because he did admit to how move David's body afterwards. Matthew ordered him to help. Once again, when he was charged, Matthew Malat showed absolutely no emotion whatsoever. All three of them were kept in custody whilst they awaited their court proceedings and whilst the detectives continued with building their case against them whilst they continued looking for further evidence. And it wasn't long before the police found what would be one of their biggest pieces of evidence in this case. It was evidence that they discovered on Cohen Klein's mobile phone. If you recall, when he was arrested at his home, his phone was seized by the police to be searched, and what they found on there was a file, a file that Cohen Klein had recently deleted. But of course, the police have ways of getting it back, and when they retrieved it, they quickly realised what this file was. It was a video and audio recording of David Octoloni's murder. Cohen Klein had recorded it on his phone. Now, I believe it took quite a while for this recording to actually be recovered. And before the police had it, they did ask Cohen Klein if he had made any kind of recording of the murder on his phone. They knew that he had his phone with him that night. So they asked him if he recorded what happened to David. And he said, no, he didn't. However, that was a lie. He had, and now the police had the proof. The recording was about 14 minutes long in total, just over 14 minutes. These were the last 14 minutes of David Octoloni's life. For obvious reasons, the recording has never been made public, but the detectives who did recover it have described what you can what you can see slash hear. Like I said, Cohen Klein was the one recording, and at the start of the video, the detective said that you can see David by the driver's side of the vehicle rolling a joint, and the group were joking about how terrible he was at it, how badly he was rolling this joint. And then following this is when David must have been called around to the boot of the car where he was confronted with Matthew and the axe, because you can hear on the recording what sounds like David having been wounded. So that was probably the first blow with the axe. That was when Matthew struck him in the upper torso. After this, Matthew can be heard on the recording basically just taunting David. There are actually transcripts of parts of the recording online. So I'll read a couple of quotes from it now. So you can hear David crying in the background and Matthew just keeps shouting at David repeatedly to stay on the ground and look at the dirt. He says, quote, look at the fucking dirt, Octo. I'm going to fucking kill you if you keep fucking moving. Look at the ground and answer my questions. You keep looking at me, I'll cut your head off. Look at the ground. Tell me, is it true you have been going around telling people about my affairs? To which David responds saying, no, it is not true, Matt. Now, from what I understand, what Matthew is referring to there about his affairs is he was accusing David of telling people people about Matthew's stealing habits. He would often steal and commit theft, I believe. According to a couple of sources, he accused David of telling people that Matthew had stolen money from his 
mother's house. He basically just accused David of having wronged him, of snitching on him, and he claimed that that was why he was doing to him what he was doing. But David denied it on the recording. He kept saying, it's not true, it's not true, I swear. At one point, David was heard saying, quote, I'm serious, man. I swear to God to you, dude. I never said nothing about you. He said, I give you my word. But Matthew just said that he didn't believe him. And towards the end of the recording, Matthew is heard saying, quote, yeah, you give me your word and your word isn't fucking good enough, Octo. I've had your word before and it ain't worth a pinch of cold fucking shit. And following this, apparently you can hear the sound of David being hit hit with the axe again, this time in the head, in the back of the head, and this was when David went silent. I actually don't know the exact number of times Matthew hit David with the axe. I don't know if it was just the two blows that we've talked about, the first one being in his upper torso slash ribs area and the final one in his head, but obviously the final one in his head would have been enough to kill him. That was the fatal blow. And after that blow to his head, the recording ended. Cohen Klein stopped recording and that was the end of the murder. And the police did hear Chase Day on the recording trying to stop Matthew, just like he said he did. He got out of the car and he was heard begging Matthew to stop hurting David. But Matthew, of course, didn't. He just told Chase to shut up, stay out of it and get back in the vehicle. Cohen Klein, on the other hand, didn't try to intervene once. He didn't do anything to try and help David. Some sources even state that Chase asked Cohen to try and stop Matthew at one point, but Cohen refused. Instead, he just sat there and he recorded it, which I imagine was probably arranged beforehand. He and Matthew probably agreed that Matthew would commit the murder and Klein would record it. Matthew probably wanted to listen to it back afterwards. So this recording proved to the police that Chase Day was telling the truth. He really did try to stop the attack but when Matthew told him to get back in the car he did what he said because he was scared that if he didn't he would be Matthew's next target. In June of 2011, so about seven, eight months after the murder, the police obtained even more evidence in the case when a member of the public discovered a wallet discarded in a river embargo and this wallet belonged to David. Octoloni. So clearly it had been dumped in the river by Matthew Malat shortly after the murder in an attempt to get rid of evidence and the detectives began thinking could he have dumped anything else in the river that was related to the case. So dive teams were sent in to search it and they found that sure enough he did. They actually discovered the murder weapon in the water, the double-sided axe that he used to kill David. So by this point, the police had gathered a substantial amount of evidence. They now had the murder weapon, David's wallet. According to one source, David's mobile phone and his iPod were also recovered from the Bargo River. They had the recording on Cohen Klein's mobile phone. They had blood evidence from Matthew Malat's clothing. I believe they had additional evidence from other friends of Malat. They they told the police that just the day after the murder, Matthew was bragging to them about it. I don't think he told them that he killed David, but his words were, quote, do you know what my family is known for? I killed somebody last night. He's also reported to have said, quote, you know me, you know my family, you know the last name Malat, I did what they do. And as well as all of that, they also had the account from Chase Day, which proved to be accurate following the discovery of the recording. And because his account was accurate and he was telling the truth about trying to intervene, the charges against Chase Day were actually dropped. They were dropped in September of 2011, which had a lot of people divided in their opinions, I think. I think some people understood why they had been dropped. They understood the pretty impossible situation that Chase was in that night, whereas others didn't think that it was fair. According to news articles, David's family members were actually very, very upset when Chase Day's charges were dropped. I think mainly because they couldn't understand why it had taken Chase Day 19 hours, almost a whole day, before he went to the police station and told them about what happened. Yes, in that moment, when David was being attacked, Chase was powerless. He couldn't do anything 
anything without risking Matthew turning the axe on him too. But as I said, David's family were just so confused as to why it took Chase till the following evening to go to the police. So yeah, I think the decision to drop the charges against Chase was met with quite a bit of controversy. But alas, they were dropped, I believe on the agreement that he would have to give evidence against Matthew Malat and Cohen Klein during their court proceedings. When it came to their plea hearings, both accused Matthew and Cohen decided to actually plead guilty to their charges, guilty to murder, probably in the hopes that if they owned up to what they did, they might get less time in jail and of course because they pleaded guilty that meant that neither would have to go to trial they just had to be sentenced. Before he was sentenced Matthew Malat was actually examined by a psychiatrist just to see if he was in any way mentally ill at the time that he committed the killing. Was he suffering from schizophrenia or psychosis or anything like that which might have meant that he couldn't be held fully responsible for his actions. However, the psychiatrist ultimately came to the conclusion that he was fine. He wasn't mentally ill. He really was just a cold blooded calculated killer. Now before Malat was actually sentenced he wrote and sent a letter to David's family and this letter was apparently of him apologising for what he did which was a huge contrast before he had never shown an ounce of remorse but now he was saying sorry in a letter. However, as you can imagine, the Ottoloni family did not care for this letter at all. It didn't change anything. It wasn't going to bring David back, so what use is it to them? And actually, the family and a lot of people don't believe that Matthew was even really sorry at all. They believed that he just sent this letter right before the sentencing because he was hoping that if he looked as though he was remorseful, the judge would take that into account and hopefully his sentence wouldn't be as harsh. And it was made clear through other things that Matthew wrote that he didn't feel remorse because whilst he was in custody, he actually wrote these sick and twisted poems about David's murder. One of the poems was called Your Last Day and I actually have it here to read for you but be warned it is so incredibly creepy and chilling. So the poem goes, click clack, hear that, stopping in the middle of the track. Are you getting nervous in the back? Should be, you're getting whacked. Talk shit here, talk shit there, no one's really gonna care, but talk shit with every breath, you just signed away your house. I can see you start to sweat, wondering what you're gonna get, hoping for one in the head, I'll put it in your leg. Tell me, are you having fun? Get up and start to run. How far are you going to get your match you have just met? Stumbling all over the place, hear the crunch of leaves and feet, feel your heart skip a beat. Are you going to get away? No hope, kid. This is your day. The day that you won't be found six feet underneath the ground. In May of 2012, Matthew and Cohen were finally sentenced for the premeditated murder of 17-year-old David Octoloni. So let's talk about Cohen Klein's sentence first. So evidence obviously suggests that Klein knew what was going to happen that night way before it happened. He knew what Matthew was going to do to David that night and he did nothing to try and stop it. He may have even encouraged it. One documentary I watched actually suggested that on the night of the murder when Matthew was waiting around the boot of the car with the axe for David, he actually made some sort of signal to Klein that he was ready and to send David to the back of the vehicle. So if that's true, clearly they had arranged for Matthew to do this signal beforehand, before they went to the forest that night. As we know, Klein recorded the whole thing on his phone and the 14 minute recording was actually played out in the court during the men's sentencing hearing. So all of David's loved ones had to sit there and listen to him being brutally murdered. Him begging for his life. Klein tried to delete the recording off of his phone after the murder. He was obviously trying to delete evidence, but clearly he was unaware of the fact that the police are able to retrieve previously deleted files. So for his part in the murder, Cohen Klein was sentenced to 32 years in prison, I believe with a non-parole period of 22 years. Whereas Matthew Malat, he obviously received a much higher sentence because he was the one who physically 
basically carried out the murder with the axe. He was sentenced to 43 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years. They did both try to appeal their sentences just the following year in the summer of 2013. Both Malat and Klein felt as though their sentences were too harsh and should be reduced. So they both appealed and whilst Matthew's appeal was rejected, Cohen Klein's appeal was actually successful and he had two years taken off of his non-parole period. So I believe he would have to serve 20 years in prison before he could apply for parole, not 22 years. And obviously prison is where both men remain to this day and where Matthew Millat especially will hopefully remain for the rest of his life. But why did Matthew do this? Why did he decide to kill David that day? Obviously, as we know from the recording, he claimed that he was basically getting revenge on David for having wronged him. He accused David of having told people about his stealing habit, something that David was adamant that he never did. And to be completely honest, I don't think that that was true. I think that that was just a lie that Matthew came up with to try and somehow justify his actions in his own mind. In my opinion, Matthew did what he did literally just because he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his killer uncle, Ivan Milat. As I've said many times throughout this video, he idolised this man. He almost worshipped him. It was like he wanted to continue Ivan's legacy even though he never even knew him or met him. He wanted to kill him in the same place that Ivan murdered murdered and buried his victims, the Belangelo State Forest. Maybe Matthew thought that news of his crime might reach Ivan in prison and Ivan would be proud of his nephew, I don't know. But yeah, that is it for this case. That is the case of David Octoloni. Please let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments. I want to hear what you guys think. I think that this is just an insane case. The fact that this killer literally brutally murdered one of his best friends just because he wanted to copy his killer uncle. It's something that I just can't wrap my head around. So let me know your opinions in the comments. Also let me know if you would like to see a video on Ivan Milat and I will try and get around to covering that case at some point soon. Thank you so so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!